Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Arkea, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those just voyaging into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. So often, when we know we are surrounded by people we can trust, we let down our guards. In the company of family, co-workers, or caregivers, we feel out of harm's way. But when ghosts, spirits, or even evil entities become involved, no one is safe. First, a devil's got your tongue, followed by a deadly family secret. Then, a violent uprising. Finally, in our featured story, an infamous hospital of many secrets. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. If you'd like to support Something Scary, then consider joining our Patreon. As a patron, not only can you help the show and see ad-free episodes, but you can also be a part of the horror and hear your name featured on one of our podcasts or weekly video stories. Visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? South African Tales of Terror Obsession is powerful. It's a drive that can inspire great feats and accomplishments, but if you're not careful, it can sink you into dangerous territory, like in this story inspired by Michael Thomas Lee. Archaeologist Dr. Jeremy Abel and his protege Matthias were halfway through their latest desert expedition on the trail of an ancient artifact known only as the Hand of the Gods. Very little was known about exactly what it was or what powers it was supposed to possess, but they'd learned it would be hidden behind an unusual slab covered in hieroglyphs. Having snaked through various parts of the sprawling African continent, one morning, before the heat had become unbearable, they passed a small caravan Abel attempted to question the elder of the tribe and was met with undecipherable garbled nonsense. Looking around, he noticed they all appeared afflicted somehow, abandoned by speech and the ability to communicate. The elder opened his mouth to reveal a hideous stump. Shaken, Matthias asked his mentor what could have happened. Abel pointed to a staff held by the elder, the gnarled stick adorned with dry, useless slugs of flesh. Tongues. He told his people that it appears they made a covenant, consecrated by a grisly vow of silence. They took several photos for posterity, the doctor filling in his journal with scribbled descriptions. After two more days of travel, Close to exhaustion, they reached the edge of a giant crater, the sides spreading wide into the desert. Curious, they slid down into the trench. Lying flat in the center of the crater was a slab. It looked ancient, of unknown material covered with markings and strange, indiscernible hieroglyphs. Could this finally be what they'd been searching for? Matthias tapped the toe of his boot on the surface. Kneeling before the black diamond exterior, he caressed the markings. Dr. Abel was enraptured. He had never seen anything like it before. It felt like a momentous discovery. Matthias threw out possible explanations. Maybe it was a burial mound. A place of worship, but it was shaped like a door laid on its side. Abel knocked on it. It sounded almost like there was something below it. But how to enter? There was no way they could move on. What they'd found was too important. 
they pitched camp in the belly of the crater for further study. That night, they could see moonlight bouncing off the sharp surface of the slab. Matthias tried to sleep, but he couldn't help but notice the doctor was restless, still studying the mysterious door-like object. It almost looked like he was muttering to it. The next morning, Matthias awoke to find Dr. Abel standing over him. Matthias weirded out, told his mentor that maybe now would be a good time to move on. Abel replied, with a mixture of coldness and awe, that something miraculous had happened last night. That the slab had spoken to him and he knew how to open it. Ah! Abel hurled himself at Matthias, pinning him to the ground. Matthias tried to struggle despite the shock, but his mentor was too strong. Abel told Matthias that the door could only be opened after a covenant was signed in blood. Taking a switchblade, mumbling a curt apology, he hacked off Matthias's tongue. As his protege gurgled on the ground, Abel approached the slab and lovingly laid the appendage on it, smearing around the blood. Matthias could barely believe this. He tried to call out, failing to register that he was now mute. Dr. Abel looked at him like one might regard a baby too clueless to understand the world. Abel stepped onto the slab and astoundingly it gave way and the archaeologist descended underground. He bade his former protege farewell as he disappeared beneath the sands. Much later, a jeep full of carefree tourists hurtled through the dunes. Suddenly, they noticed a dust-covered, disheveled figure staggering along, completely alone. They pulled over and asked who he was. Was he okay? Did he need water, a a ride? At that, an exhausted Matthias looked up. All he could do was emit a gargled, crazed laugh through his tongueless mouth. Thank you so much, Michael Thomas Lee, for this African exploration. Listener, would you be able to stomach the things Matthias saw? What would you have done if you had encountered the tongueless people on the side of the road? Has anything even approaching this happened in your life or do you have a really good story to tell of something like this did? Tell us at something scary at snarl.com. Family is complicated. They're supposed to be your closest connections, sources of comfort and care, but that's not always a guarantee. Not everyone in your family can have your best interests at heart. Like in this story, inspired by Chi-Chi. I hated family reunions. At eight years old, the last thing I wanted to do was travel the five hours to the little town where most of my family still lived in Zambia. But my parents insisted we go several times a year. I just wanted to play with my friends. I didn't want to hang out with a bunch of extended family I didn't even like. And I especially didn't want to see my uncle. There was something about him that was just off. He was always nervous, always looking over his shoulder. He often seemed sickly and stared off into space. It was unnerving, especially to a child. No one even knew what he did for a living. Whenever asked, He would say he was a business salesman, which required him to travel for long periods of time. He would appear far happier upon his return. On the car ride over, I asked my dad where my uncle goes on business. He laughed. Who knows? 
probably to see witches or wizards. But my mom told him off, saying he shouldn't joke about that. She told me to keep my distance from uncle. I could greet him, but I shouldn't shake his hand or linger with him. She wouldn't say why. It just added to my sense of unease. I was certain they knew more than they were letting on. Once at the reunion, I felt out of place as always, surrounded by people I only half knew, but I recognized my uncle immediately. He wore a large, ill-fitting suit that hung awkwardly off his body. He looked worse than usual, gaunt, and his complexion was sallow. As he limped towards me, I tried to back away, but was caught by his wife, my aunt. A sweet woman, she practically forced a bowl of delele, an okra dish, into my hands. It had been hours since I had eaten, so I eagerly accepted it. Soon after, though, sharp pains shot through my stomach. I told my parents I needed to lay down. My aunt suggested her house, which was just down the street. My parents were initially hesitant, but as long as she was there to watch over me, they'd be comfortable. Their home was sparse and poorly lit, and there was a strange smell lingering in the air. My aunt led me to her bedroom. She was heading back to the reunion, but told me to rest. And if I wanted, she'd left another steaming hot bowl of delele on the bedside table. I heard the door quietly close behind her. I crunched into a ball, trying to lessen my stomach ache. At least I could get away from my family and try to sleep. But then I heard something that was otherworldly, a sound I'd never heard before, a hissing mixed with a croak, and it was coming from under the bed. Immediately I hopped off it, but collapsed to the floor. My stomach was in knots, the pain even worse. I looked in the direction of the noise and saw it slither out, out from under the bed came the Alamba, half crocodile, half snake, but with the head of my uncle. So it was true. They do exist. The Alamba is a creature that is made for you by a witch or a wizard with your own blood or fingernails and can be used to kill your enemies. But why was I there? I ran to the door, but it was locked. I banged on it begging to be let out. Then I heard my aunt. She hadn't returned to the party. She apologized for poisoning me, but she had to get me inside her house. The Alamba and her husband were connected. When it grows weak, he grows weak. To save her husband, the Alamba must be fed immediately. I turned to face this hideous monster, fast approaching. I swerved out of the way. Trapped in a small room, I looked around for anything I could use as a weapon. Nothing. I was doomed. I crouched in the corner, awaiting my fate. The Alumba charged at me, right as it extended its mouth, ringed by jagged, decayed teeth. I instinctively picked up the bowl of Delele, putting a pathetic barrier between myself and this creature. It easily chumped the whole bowl in one bite, taking it all in a gulp. I expected I was dessert. But then, the creature started to rise. It cried out in pain, burning from the stew it had just consumed. Suddenly, I remembered the creature couldn't consume anything hot. As it thrashed on the floor, I climbed out a window and escaped. I rushed back to my parents, expecting that they would be thrilled, but they looked anguished. Something had happened to my uncle. All of a sudden, he had collapsed. He had screamed that his insides were burning. Medical had been called, but looking at his now still chest and unblinking eyes, they knew he couldn't be saved. I knew what had happened to him. By killing the Ilamba, 
I had also killed my uncle who had been connected to it spiritually at the time. I never told my parents the truth. And I never went to another family reunion again. Thank you so much, Chi Chi, for inspiring this family reunion horror tale for us. How about you, listener? Do you get uncomfortable around any family members? Do you suspect they could have dark secrets? Are any of those secrets supernatural? When someone is being mistreated, you must stand up and fight back. But go too far, and you become the monster. Like in this story inspired by Abu Bakar. Madame Koi Koi was a teacher at a prestigious private school in Cape Town, South Africa. However, instead of being well-loved and respected, her students were terrified. You see... Madame Koi Koi was known for flogging, inflicting great pain. She hit the children with a yardstick anytime she felt like it. She was such a force that even the other teachers were afraid of her, and as a result, refused to reprimand her for her abusive behavior. Finally, her students had had enough of the abuse. One night, after school... A bunch of them arranged to wait outside the school and hide. They were going to scare her so badly that she would never hurt them again. When Madame Koi Koi exited the building that night, the students jumped out of hiding and grabbed her. First, they bound and gagged her so that she couldn't scream, then dragged her behind the school out of sight. They'd rough her up, frighten her into submission. Gleefully, they took their revenge, shouting, kicking, getting carried away. One student pulled off one of Madame Koi Koi's cherry red heel pumps and knocked the teacher in the head with it. The students were out of control, and before they knew it, Madame Koi Koi had stopped fighting back, stopped moving, stopped breathing. They had gone too far. The students were horrified. They never meant to kill her. They'd merely wanted to teach her a lesson let her know they weren't going to take her abuse anymore. They were terrified about what would happen if they were found out. Panicking, they threw her body up and over the back fence behind the school, hoping to get away with their crime. They swore never to discuss it again. Thado, the boy who had hit her with her own cherry red high heel, kept the red shoe and hid it in his dormitory, Afraid the police would trace it back to him if he had left it somehow. At first, it seemed like the students had gotten away with it. The authorities assumed it was a vicious robbery gone wrong. But then, students started to disappear. One by one, 12 out of the 13 teens who had killed Madame Koi Koi vanished into thin air. Thado was the sole survivor and he was terrified. He began to tell his classmates that Madame Koi Koi was haunting the school and killing everyone. No one believed him, of course. They thought he made it up to scare them. Thado insisted that she was coming for him next because he could hear her uneven footsteps clacking down the hall. One step, a noisy high heel, the other, a silent barefoot. He begged his classmates to help him, but no one did. They thought he was mad. The following night, after listening to the horrifying footsteps pacing outside of his bedroom for hours, Thado couldn't take it anymore. He stood up from his bed, pulled her red shoe from his hiding spot, failing to notice it was sticky. Grabbing the door handle, Thado hoped that if he returned the shoe to his rightful owner, maybe she would spare his life in return. He took a deep breath to steady his trembling hand and open the door. He saw nothing. He waited. The noise started up again, but further away, down the hall and moving away from him. 
he followed it. The footsteps led him outside, behind the school, to the scene of the murder. They stopped, and suddenly the full image of Madame Koi Koi appeared. One red high heel, one bare foot. She glared at Thado. He whimpered in fear, tears streaming from his eyes and pathetically offered her the shoe. She threw her head back and laughed in his face. Suddenly, she locked eyes with him and he froze. Mouth hung open. His eyes looked like they were thousands of miles away. Madame Koi Koi had hypnotized him. Now, he would do whatever she wanted. He swung at himself with the red high heel, hitting right between his own eyes. He didn't even flinch from the pain. He just kept swinging the shoe. Madame Koi Koi laughed maniacally at the pain she was making him inflict upon himself. Thank you, Thado, for returning my cherry red high heel to me. And thank you for using it to eliminate all of your accomplices. As it turns out, I can't touch anyone now that I'm dead. But I'm sure glad I figured out how to hypnotize you and make you do my dirty work for me. A series of images passed through Thado's mind witnessing himself slaughtering each and every one of the other 12 students who had been a part of the terrible accident. Even in death, the teacher had been able to inflict the most heinous pain, using the entranced boy to do her bidding. Watching him continue to smack himself, she cackled in glee. Returning the shoe to her foot, the spirit strutted away. Finally, able to walk evenly again. The next morning, Thado's body was found behind the school, along with the bodies of all the missing students. They each had been beaten to death, heads pulverized, but with one prominent hole between their eyes, which looked as though it could have been made by the heel of a stiletto. Now, Madame Koi Koi wanders from school to school, haunting the halls, tormenting students by hypnosis so they never even remember their crimes. Thank you so much, Abu Bakar, for inspiring this, frankly, terrifying teacher tale for us. Listener, Ever feel like you've been taunted by a Madame Koi Koi? How far would you go to protect yourself from that type of behavior? And what kind of repercussions do you think you could weather? Life is filled with so many unanswered questions. But the quest for knowledge can drive us to find the truth, or it can drive us mad trying to find the answers. Sibongole grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa's biggest and very picturesque major city. But there were things about her past that troubled her, like the fact she was born in the once highly renowned, but now infamously haunted Kempton Park Hospital which inexplicably closed its doors on the day after Christmas in 1996. There were rumors of extreme malpractice, but officials debunked the claims, stating it was just understaffed and in the wrong area. Every so often, someone in the local government placated the public, suggesting it was going to be renovated and reopened, but the false promises never came to fruition. The grounds are empty and most say are haunted without any official explanations. To this day, abandoned hospital beds still lined the halls. Jars of organs rotted in the labs and splatters of blood covered the walls. Sabongale was resolved to brave the grounds regardless. She'd heard there were old files still inside and having been adopted, was hoping to find information about her birth parents, 
unable to access current records through the normal official channels because of her age. Late one night, she snuck out of her house and rode her bike to the hospital. She locked her bike to a fence, pulled out her flashlight, and quickly found a way in through a broken door. As soon as she entered the building, she was overcome by a horrid stench. She gagged, pulling her shirt up over her nose and mouth. The building was somehow freezing cold inside, and she wished she had brought a jacket, but she continued on, determined to get what she had come for. Sibongale followed the dilapidated signs, guiding her deeper to the maternity ward. As she got closer, she heard babies crying, but none could be there. The hospital had suddenly closed almost 20 years ago, staff even leaving behind expensive equipment. Although there hadn't been any patients left when it was abandoned, she still shuddered at the thought of those who had not made it out alive during the time it was open. Just outside the nursery, she found an office with multiple filing cabinets. She thumbed through the files, searching for her name, but there were so many. After what felt like the hundredth baby girl named Sibongale, she felt goosebumps pop up all over her neck and arms. Finally, this must be me, she thought, looking at the birth date. The file listed Operating Room 4 as the site of her birth, but there were no names listed for her parents. The only clue was that following her own name was the last name Sitole. Sabongale clutched the file to her chest and wandered down the hallway, weaving around empty beds with bloody sheets and various surgical implements strewn haphazardly across the floor. She was looking for the operating room where she was brought into the world. Maybe there were other files or clues there. The crying grew louder and more desperate, but Sibongale continued. After what felt like forever, she finally saw a sign that had dropped to the floor years ago that read, OR4. She peered through the large, dirty window and saw an old operating table and surgical equipment. Everything was there, except the doctors. She tentatively stepped inside. Suddenly, the door slammed shut behind her. Whipping around, she pulled the handle, but it wouldn't budge. Sibongale began to panic. She looked around for another exit, but there was none. The sound of babies crying was now deafening. She had the feeling she was being surrounded. She spun around, searching, but saw no one. She was having trouble breathing, and her throat began to burn, breathing becoming harder and harder. The sensation spread throughout her body, and she fell to the floor, writhing in pain until... Suddenly it stopped, and everything was still. Slowly, she opened her eyes and screamed. She was surrounded by ghosts of all ages. The small ghost of a five-year-old girl spoke to her in a whisper. Sibongole Sitole, you were brought into this world here in OR4, just like the rest of us. We tried to warn you away, but now that you have returned, This is also where you will leave this world. The spirit added, Now you are one of us. Subongale looked down at her hands and instead of flesh and bone, now saw nothing but the faded translucent outline of her ghostly extremities. Through her tears, she tried to tell them that she was alive, but she wasn't anymore. She was just like the rest of them now. Those fortunate enough to have made it out once should have never returned. Sibongale saw a flashlight outside the operating window. She looked up to see a small group of people, amateur ghost hunters, no doubt. How ironic. I saw a bike outside, so there's gotta be someone in here, someone said. 
Sibongle ran to the glass and banged on it, shouting for help, but they couldn't hear her pleas. Their flashlight beams shone straight into their eyes, but they could not see her. They tried the locked door once and then moved on. A Sibongle wailed, joining the cries of those who surrounded her, forever trapped inside OR4. This week's podcast stories were edited by Markia McCarty, Janine Pipe, and Sarah Lukasowicz. Narration by Markia McCarty. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Mari Carlson. Produced by Hannah Mullen and Markia McCarty. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman. <laughs>